I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 is our text today. So we're continuing our study in the book of Romans. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you today or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,127, and you will find Romans chapter 12, uh, and you'll be able to join with us and follow along in the text. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, um, you just showed up today and, and you think, hey, I'd, I'd like to have a Bible, please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, I just got to say I'm excited about Serve Our Schools. You know, it's coming up, and uh, we've been talking about it, and, uh, and I want your help because, uh, basically, I'm lazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to be at the schools, and most of the schools still need a few more volunteers. And, and so uh, I would love for you to join us. If you're in town and you're able physically to, to be there Saturday morning and help out for a couple hours, that'd be awesome. Pick a school and show up or stop by the table and sign up. Uh, email serve at calvarylhd.com and let them know you're going to be there. Uh, and I just personally, I'm going to invite you because, again, I, I, I love, you know, many hands make light work. I just love the fact that, that people come out. I'm going to be with my life group at Nautilus Elementary Friday night at 5 o'clock. We're doing some prep work. And, uh, and if you want to come help us out, I'm not going to be opposed to that because I'm no good at it anyway. And, uh, and then Saturday, I'm going to come around and just visit all the schools and see uh, who's there and cheer you on and celebrate the fact that you guys are serving our schools in our community. So uh, don't miss this opportunity. It's a great way to let God uh, teach you as well as use you to bless others in Jesus' name. So have you ever been around somebody who really, really rubbed you the wrong way? Okay, you guys, some of you have. That's, that's good. I'm talking about, though, the kind of person that goes way beyond just annoyance. I'm not talking about that person who just kind of irritates you. I'm talking about somebody who got mean, who got ugly, who slandered you, who attacked your character, who threatened your livelihood, uh, who tried to ruin your life. Uh, maybe it was a boss or a coworker who tried to submarine you in, in your career. Maybe it was an in-law or a sibling uh, who was jealous. Maybe uh, it was a neighbor, an acquaintance, you know, for no reason that you can know of. Or maybe it was an ex. Uh, someone who opposed you, who offended you, someone that other people might call your enemy. Do uh, you have a mental picture now in your head? You got, you got somebody there? Some of you, actually, as I'm talking about that, uh, you're like, why are you having to bring that up? We just sang this great song, and now I'm thinking about the person I don't want to think about in church. And, and without even realizing it, you clenched your fists, or you gritted your teeth, uh, or maybe I should say I'm sorry because some of you, your blood pressure went up. Because you're thinking about that person who has hurt you or persons who have hurt you, uh, offended you, broken your life. Uh, so today we're talking about practical faith. And, and we started last week discussing genuine love. And, and now we're going to move on. Same text. Talking about what to do with difficult people in our lives. Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be looking at beginning at verse 14 where we left off last week. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church. And by the way, can I just say that this is not a fun passage to read. Okay, you're going to read this, uh, follow along with me, listen to it. And it's difficult. It's hard to hear what the Apostle is saying to the church at Rome, which applies to the church at Calvary. And, and so we need to hear this, uh, but I'm just giving you a heads up. It, it's not pleasant. The Apostle says, verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The Apostle Paul lays down a challenge for everyone who is a Jesus follower. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, 
then the expectation is that you are going to listen to Jesus' challenge about how to deal with difficult, angry, destructive people in life. So let's look at what Paul says. First of all, the goal is to live peaceably with all. The goal is to live peaceably with all. Verse 18 he, he's kind of the linchpin of this passage, covering that which is before and after. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. As, it, as much as it depends on you. So the first step in dealing with angry, vindictive, destructive people is don't be one. Okay? Don't be that person. Don't be that angry person. Don't be that vindictive person. Don't be that destructive person uh, because... This is about living out genuine love. And Paul says the responsibility is on us. It's on you. As far as this depends on you, live at peace. Be at peace. In other words, you've got a responsibility. I've got a responsibility on how we carry out our lives so that we can um, live out the Jesus ethic. You see, most of us know this. Most of us know the, you know, the words of, of the Apostle Paul. We know the words of Jesus, and we know how we're supposed to live. But the question is, are we going to actually do it? Are we going to actually embrace it and say, hey, this is difficult, but I'm going to do this because I'm a Jesus follower, and I'm going to live out the Jesus ethic. So that means that we choose to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus is teaching. It's in the Beatitudes. You're going to read it this week if you're doing the 50-day Bible reading plan, uh, which I highly recommend. And if you haven't started it yet, you can pick up a guide out at the Connection Center and, and continue on with us and keep reading. Uh, just flip it over. So, so here's the thing. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the people. He says, if you are a person who keeps the peace, who makes peace, who promotes peace, then people will identify you as having been with God. Children of God. They're going to say, hey, you're, you're a godly person because you are a peacemaker. So I think that's kind of cool. But then we have to go, okay, what's a peacemaker? What does a peacemaker look like? Well, here's the picture that I have in my mind when I think about a peacemaker. Maybe this will help you uh, in terms of how you think about being a peacemaker in relationships. Uh, every relationship that I've ever been in and every relationship you've probably been in has had heated moments, right? You know, there's conflict, some sparks fly, uh, and maybe there's some, uh, you know, outrage. So it, it's kind of like it's a, it's a fire. And sometimes the conflict is like a little brush fire. Sometimes it's like a raging inferno. But every time there's conflict, it's, it's kind of like there's, there's a fire. So when that occurs in your relationships, are you throwing water on the fire or gasoline? Because you got that option, right? The, the conflict starts. It's blowing up. There's a little bit of a heated exchange. Are you somebody who's going to, you know, try to put it out? Or are you going to be somebody who tries to blow it up? Because that's what a, a peacemaker is, somebody who tries to restrain the fire, contain, contain the fire, not add to the fire. And the, and the reality is that some of us are relational arsonists instead of relational firefighters. Now you think about that. We, 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 we just can't help it. And, and, and here's some of the things that happen that, that escalate the fires, that are gasoline. Whenever we have to be right... We're going to escalate the fire. Whenever we have to win the argument, whenever we have to get the last word, whenever we have to prove that we're smarter than everybody else in the room, then, then we're going to be throwing uh, gasoline on the fires of relationships rather than trying to put them out. So realistically, are you making the fires worse or are you containing them? Because peacemakers are those who live their lives extinguishing fires. And that means that peacemakers... Well, they learn how to speak, listen, and interpret with grace. Speak, listen, and interpret with grace. Now, if you read the Bible, you know that we are to speak with grace. Okay, one of the passages that in the 50-day re Bible reading that we did the, this last week was Proverbs 12. And Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Think about that. If you're reckless with your words, it's just like you're just swinging a, a, a sharp object around gashing people. But the tongue of the wise brings healing to people. 
Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So in your relationships with people, are you giving grace with your words? Because that's the expectation of peacemakers. They speak with grace, but peacemakers also listen with grace and interpret with grace. See, a lot of times we forget about listening with grace. Uh, we, th we forget about interpreting with grace. See, what that means is that peacemakers give people the benefit of the doubt. Instead of just... Uh, you know, assuming that people aren't trustworthy. They give people the benefit of the doubt until they prove otherwise. They, they assume the best intentions, not the worst. How often do we judge others and just assume the worst about what they said or what they did, and, and, and we judge them and condemn them and throw gasoline on the fire of conflict because uh, we don't take what they do or say at face value. See, peacemakers will... Uh, not just uh, do that, but they'll ask for clarification and allow people to restate their ideas better. You know, ask for clarification. Hey, what did you say? I didn't quite catch that. And, and I don't know about the rest of you in here, but uh, my hearing is not as good as it used to be. And, and what amazes me is how we'll have conversations. Like the worse our hearing gets, the further apart we'll be when we try to talk to each other. Right? Because are we the only people that talk to each other from different rooms in the house? In fact, if I want to make my wife talk to me, all I have to do is leave the room. <laughs> right? And then suddenly I'll hear her talking, and I know she said something to me, but I'm like, I don't have, I just walk back in and go, you know I didn't hear you, right? But what's funny is sometimes you hear something, and you know it's not what they said. It's crazy, right? And, and you know, but at that point, you can either get the gasoline out and go in there and say, what do you mean you said this? And then you argue about what they said or didn't say. Right? Gasoline. Or you can do water and just walk back in and go, hey, you know what I heard you say? I know it's not what you meant, but here's what I heard. Ask questions. What, what did you say? I didn't quite catch that. I'm not sure I heard that correctly. See, that's, that's what peacemaking looks like. It listens with grace. It responds with grace. And, and that'll change the dynamic of your relationships. By the way, there is no grace in statements like, I know what you meant. I know you guys never use that, that line, but, uh, and you don't want to use that line. I know what you meant. You know what I know what you meant means? It means, hey, I'm playing God, and I'm reading your mind. I'm judging your motives. I don't care what you said. Think about that. I don't care the words. I know what you meant. You don't actually have that ability to read their heart. God does. Or, or when you say, I can read between the lines. Really, you can read between the lines. So, see, that's a, that, there's no grace there. Uh, whenever we say you said instead of what did you say? Instead of, whenever we accuse rather than asking a question, there's no grace involved in that. And, and, and just this reality alone, if you'll just do this, it'll, it'll change your dynamic in your family because we'll stop accusing and attacking and escalating and throwing gasoline on the fire and we'll start putting the fires out. And we ought to do this because Jesus gives us grace and we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. And yet he pours out his grace on us. So let's give it to others with our words and with our listening. Let's be peacemakers. If at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So what do we do then when we're graceful and they're not? What do we do when we're graceful and they attack, they manipulate, they slander, they lie, they try to hurt us? That's a great question. So let's discuss the radical response to offenders. The radical response to offenders. What do we do with the people who are just offensive towards us? The people who, let's just be honest, they're enemies. Okay, they're trying to cause harm to us. Uh, whether they see it that way or not, that's the way we experience it. And I want to share a radical response for two reasons. First of all, it's radical because it's, it's going to seem crazy. I mean, you've already read the preview. Okay, you know what the Bible says, but it doesn't, really kind of register that this is what God expects us to do if we're followers of Jesus Christ. And secondly, it's radical because it's the Jesus response. It's what Jesus did with people. It's how he responded when he was attacked. And, and so we need to learn from him because we are followers of... <laughs> All right, you guys did better than the other services. Can I just tell you that? 
There was like a pocket of eight people here that said, got the answer right, but they said it out loud. We're followers of who? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we said earlier. And if we call Jesus Lord, Master, then, then he's the one whose words we're trying to listen to and follow and, and live out. But can I just be honest? This is where it gets real. This is where our faith becomes practical and extremely difficult. So what is our biblical response to people who want to hurt us or who have succeeded in hurting us? Okay, the radical response begins with this. Bless and do not curse. Bless and do not curse. Verse 14, this is, we, we touched on this last week. This is where we ended. The apostle says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I love it when he is so blunt. Don't you love it when God's word doesn't leave any room for ambiguity? You know, it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It doesn't say, hey, bless some of those who persecute you. Bless a, a few people who say mean things about you. No, he just says all of them. Bless them. Bless and don't curse. And if you think Paul is crazy, if you think he's lost his mind at this point, he's really just restating Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 again. Uh, again, you're going to read it this week. You don't even have to wait. You can go home and read it today if you want to. Uh, verse 43 and 44, he says, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you might be children of your Father in heaven. That's Jesus. That's his expectation. I want you to... Pray for those who persecute you. I want you to love your enemies. So people try to harm you. They slander you. They vilify you. What's your response? Right now, what's your response? If, if that happened to you in this moment, because uh, I know what my flesh wants to do when that happens. I want to attack back. I, I want to, I wanna, you know, slander back. I want to say, by the way, you guys may notice I'm kind of quick with my tongue sometimes. And so the temptation is really strong. Scripture says where words are many, sin is not absent. Okay, so I have to fight that urge. And so when somebody attacks me, I want to attack back. I just want to, you know, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you what I think. You see, God tells us to bless them instead of cursing them with our words. And when we do this, when we're obedient, two things happen. First of all, it prevents bitterness from taking root in our hearts. Um, most of us want to grow older does anybody want to grow older and bitter? See, we don't want to be old and bitter. We'd like to get older, but, uh, you know, not bitter. But you know the fastest way to let bitterness take root in your heart? If somebody hurts you, somebody offends you, somebody does something to you, and, and what do you start doing? You start telling that story over and over and over again. Did you know what so-and-so said? you know what they did to me? Do you know what so-and-so said? you know what they did to me? you know what so-and-so said? And you start telling it and repeating it over and over and over again to everybody in your circle of influence. Number one, you're slandering them. And number two, you're setting bitterness in your heart. Because the more you tell the story, the more destructive it becomes in you and to you and to the relationships. Because you're putting up roadblocks to reconciliation every time you repeat the offense over and over and over again. And so if we don't want to grow old and bitter, then we need to go ahead and bless instead of curse. Because if we bless them, then that cleanses our soul of that bitterness. and doesn't allow it to take root. Second thing that happens when we're obedient and we bless instead of cursing is it allows God to bless us. How many of you would like God to bless you? See, that's a no-brainer answer. We all go, yeah, of course we want God to bless us. That's why we're here, right? We, we, we kind of like to do that. So let me just put it this way. If God says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, and you choose to curse them, how's God going to bless you in that situation? So you've put yourself in opposition to God because you've said, God, you don't understand what they did to me. I'm going to curse them instead of bless them. And, and, and God's like, well, okay, then I can't bless you. I can't bless you. If you want to be blessed by God, then you need to be obedient to God and you need to bless those who are cursing you instead of cursing them back. And, and when you do that, God does miracles. Let me just tell you how we experienced it here at Calvary. So about 14 years ago, we made some tremendous shifts in what we were doing as a church. 
I mean, we shifted from being traditional to being contemporary. We shifted from being formal to being casual. We shifted from, from focusing on taking care of church people to focusing on serving the community and reaching out to the, the unchurched radically. We shifted from doing traditional Sunday school to small groups and homes called life groups. We, we made all these shifts, and they were all great shifts, uh, great changes. But can I just be honest? I didn't always lead them exactly the best way. I don't know what I know. I didn't know then what I know now. <laughs> I'm not the only one, but I didn't know then what I know now. And so, so in that process, uh, there were a lot of people who were part of Calvary, who were, who were significant to the life of Calvary, who got hurt by that, who got angry about that, who, who uh, you know, ended up leaving the church about that. And, and they said some really hurtful things in that process. You know, they said things like, Chad's a tyrant, he's a dictator, he's, there's no accountability, uh, you know, he's, he's compromising the gospel, he's not teaching the, the truth, all, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and that... That hurt, and it made me mad, and so what did I want to do? I wanted to, you know, verbally attack back. I wanted to defend myself and defend Calvary, and, and God confronted me with Romans 12, 14. When I say confronted, you know, sort of like a baseball bat upside the head kind of confronted, kind of like burn it on my soul confronted, and, and I went, okay, God, we're just going to bless. We're just going to bless. And I told the leaders, I, we're just going to bless. doesn't matter what you hear. These are great people. They love Jesus. They're, they're trying to serve God, uh, uh, and, and we've changed a lot of stuff, and they're not happy about it, and, uh, and we're going to bless them because we want them to go and, and bless other churches. If they're not going to be here, we want them to go, and, and a lot of them are, but I tried to sit down face-to-face -face with as many people as, that were upset as I could, and, and for about two or three months, I, I just met with people, and I listened to them uh, as they uh, kind of said not-so-nice things about me and about Calvary. And, uh, and I thank them for helping to make Calvary the church that it was. I, I, I appreciated their service. I blessed them. I asked them to go and serve someplace else. I wanted them to stay here. And I went like 0 for 80 in reconciliation. I felt like a complete failure. Can I just tell you that? I mean, I thought, I'm going to win some of these people back over. I'm going to convince them. And uh, none, zero, zip. Kind of like the Cardinals winning record right now. That's <laughs> what I felt like, Okay. Except I, I had the joy of being obedient to Christ at that point. And God blessed Calvary unbelievably. I mean, we're, we're three times the size we were uh, then. And, and we, in the last five years, we baptized over 600 people. See, yeah. Now, I share that not so that you'll go, oh, wow, Chad's so good. But I share that because I learned that when you will obey Christ, he will show up in your life in a powerful way. And, and it sounds crazy to bless people who are cursing you, but, uh, but this takes effort and discipline and faith that God's word is true. And, and it's kind of blunt, so use your words to bless. Bless and do not curse. And then the part of that radical response is we've got to refuse revenge. Refuse revenge. Verse 19. Again, I love it when he's blunt. Beloved. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, a lot of wiggle room there, right? <laughs> no, there's none. How, how often should you avenge yourselves? Never. <laughs> it's kind of like when, and this is black and white. You guys can read it for yourselves too. Never avenge yourselves. Kind of blunt. The world tells you that revenge is sweet, yeah. I mean, they sell movies on that. They build TV shows around that. You know, they, I think there was one titled Revenge. I don't know. They just, it's, it's all this idea that somehow you're going to get even. You're going to do it. And, and yet here's the word of God. The Apostle Paul is telling us to never avenge yourselves. Why? Why would, don't you want to avenge yourselves? What is, what is the secret here? This is so simple. Vengeance is God's job. He actually says it. Did you catch that? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Is that blunt enough for you? So whose job is justice? God's job. Who's better at justice, you or God? Yeah, we don't say that with conviction, do we? Yeah, we're like, I don't know about that. I'd like to take justice into my hands if I could because I, you know, I was offended and I was hurt. And God, you don't understand what they did to me. See how that's ridiculous that sounds when you say it out loud? And so we want to try to take revenge. We want to try to bring about justice for our lives and God says, um, don't do it. 
Here's what happens when we try to take justice into our hands, when we try to take revenge, because we never call it revenge. We just call it payback or getting even or, you know, it's fair, it's right. No, it, when we do that, uh, here's what happens. Number one, we fail because it's God's job. It's not ours. We can't do his job. He's God, we're not. So we're going to fail at getting what we want. And, and then secondly, uh, God's not going to act on our behalf because we tried to do his job. He's like, okay, you want to take justice in your hand? Fine, you do it. Have at it. Good luck with that. Justice is his responsibility. And if we will trust him with justice, did, did you know what he, notice what Paul says? Leave room for God's wrath. Look, if, if you really were offended, uh, then at that point, you kind of want to get out of the way and not take revenge because that person's going to be accountable to God. By the way, we're going to be accountable to God for when we wrong people as well. So trust God with the injustice that is done to you. Now, let me be really clear. If the injustice done to you was illegal or criminal, then please invite the law enforcement authorities to the table. Okay, it just, it, you know, call the police, involve them. If it was a crime, if it was illegal, then involve them. They are God's instruments of wrath. They're supposed to be God's instruments of justice. That's what scripture says. And so we need to invite the authorities in. So just for instance, ladies, if your husband is beating the crud out of you, call the police. Okay, if you come to me and tell me, I'm going to call the police for you. Okay, that's reality. It's never acceptable. And besides, prison is a great place to repent from. <laughs> See, if you think you're going to save the relationship by putting up with abuse, you're wrong. On the other hand, accountability can change people. And, and so if it's illegal or criminal, then involve the authorities. But if it's another kind of offense, if somebody's, you know, just wronged you, hurt you, offended you, then what you want to do is start praying for them. And, and when I say start praying for them, I mean on a regular, daily basis and, until you're not angry anymore. So if you're angry at someone, you start praying for them. After all, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And, and when I say pray for them, I don't mean pray that they would break down halfway between Barstow and Needles. <laughs> In the middle of summer. Right? That, that's not what I mean. I don't mean praying that, you know, something bad will happen to them. I mean, you seriously go to God and you say, God, you know, I'm angry. Because, again, this is a healthy way of dealing with your anger. If, if you're going to grow bitterness, you go tell everybody else. If you want to deal with it healthily, you tell God. And you bring your anger toward them, your hurt to, to, towards them to, with God. And, 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 you bring, and you tell them, I'm angry at them. I don't really want to pray for them, but you told me to pray for them. So, God, I want you to bless them. And you keep doing that every day until you actually mean it. Some of you are going, well, you want me to pray for something I don't mean? Yes, because God's asked you to do it. Do you know that your emotions will follow your obedience? Your obedience will never follow your emotions. Because when someone hurts you, you want to hurt them back. That's the emotional response. The obedient response is to pray for them and to bless them. And then when you do that, God begins to work in your life. First of all, again, he doesn't let that bitterness grow in your life because you're praying for them and you're praying that God would bless them and reveal his love to them. But the other thing is that he actually starts working miracles through that towards reconciliation. But you've got to pray for them. And then, you know, we bless, we don't curse, we refuse revenge, and then finally you serve your enemy. You serve your enemy. Verse 20, he says, after not taking revenge, he says, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. <laughs> Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, you see, this is genuine love lived out in a radical way. By the way, the Apostle Paul is just quoting Proverbs chapter 25 when he, when he uses this verse. But see, here's how this plays out in our lives. You're offended, you're hurt, so we do what uh, we just talked about. We begin praying for them. God bless them, God heal them. God, they're so filled with hurt, they're, they're destroying other people's lives, so open their eyes to your love and your grace and, and kindness so they can pour that out. You start praying for them, and, and God begins to heal your heart, and one day you wake up and you're not angry anymore, and you actually mean what you're praying, and, and, and God's changed you. And, and then at some point, you're going to have an opportunity to bless them with your words, and so you're going to be obedient to Christ. You're going to bless them with your words. 
you know, uh, and, and encourage them in any way you can or let other people know that you love them and you're praying for them. And, and then you're going to have that opportunity to take revenge and you're going to refuse to do it. You're going to be in that position where you have the ability to hurt them and, and you're going to go, no, instead of that, I'm going to bless them. And, you, and when you're ready, because God's doing a work in your heart, when you're ready, then God will open the door and you'll be able to serve somebody who's hurt you. And in that moment, you will have freedom and you will have the joy of Christ because you're taking on his heart and you're serving those people. And at the same time that you're serving them, if, you know, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to have, be ready to be reconciled to you and God's going to show up and it's going to be beautiful or you're going to be heaping burning coals on their head. Either one's a win. Right? Some of you are like, can't we just go straight to the heaping coals on their head? <laughs> nope. You can't. You got to do it God's way. I actually had someone last night ask me, they said, hey, well, okay, if you're, if you're serving them, if you're killing them with kindness, isn't that evil because you're taking revenge? I said, no, it's not. That's exactly what God wants you to do. He wants you to do it his way, and if you actually kill them with kindness, I'm not talking about faking it, but if you kill them with kindness, I said, you're doing it God's way, and sometimes that's the wrath of God being poured out. You just have to go ahead and trust Jesus enough to do it to follow him at that point. But when you do those things, when you take those steps, you're going to rejoice in the power of grace. You're going to celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ. You're going to see God work in reconciliation. And that's how we overcome evil by doing good. That's how we as followers of Jesus deal with difficult people. But it really boils down to this question. Do you trust God enough to practically live out your faith? Do you trust God? If you do, it'll change your life. Now, some of you, right now it's really going, yeah, that makes sense, but it, it's really easy to, to wonder or question or doubt whether or not this would actually work in the broader sense of society because we've all just watched an incredibly obscene spectacle of anger and vitriol uh, being heaped on, on one another and society. And sometimes we go, yeah, but, but is this Jesus ethic ever going to make a difference? Here's the thing. You can't worry about other people as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. And if you embrace the Jesus ethic and how you relate to other people, difficult people, if you will bless and not curse, if you will refuse revenge, if you will serve your enemies, you know what will happen? God will change your life. And he'll change your relationship with your spouse. And he'll change your relationship with your kids. It'll change your relationship at work because you'll be a new person and you'll be representing Jesus and people will see that and know that and you'll be amazed at the differences in your life. But the only way you're going to experience God's power that way is if you trust God enough to actually do it. I'm praying that you will. Will you pray with me?